All right, welcome everybody to ACT Math Crash Course Day One, uh, Part One. Um, before we get started on the, the question we see here on the screen, I want to kind of talk about um, how we're approaching the test um, and how we're going to approach um, our prep for this crash course. And um, so there's a couple things about this real quick. We're going to focus on two kind of aspects of the course. We're going to focus on the basic math concepts that you need to succeed on the ACT math section. And then we're also going to focus on um, some of the just general test taking strategies that are going to be um, really helpful for boosting your score on this test. And um, we kind of kind of intermingle both of those um, aspects of the test, the concepts and the strategies. Um, in some previous crash course classes, I've gone kind of like concept by concept. Um, and I found that it's not quite as helpful on, on the ACT just because um, there's such a wide variety of like the, the difficulty types of the questions. So instead of going by concept, I'm just kind of work through um, an ACT practice test and approach um, approach the questions just kind of as they arise on, on the practice test. So we're going to be jumping around a little bit, but um, by the end, we're going to have covered pretty much every basic concept that uh, that you're going to see on the ACT. Does that make sense, Sarah? Okay, good. Well, let's go to that first um, problem that you see on the whiteboard. Um, go ahead and read that question for me, please, and we'll talk about how to solve it. Um, the blood types of 150 people were determined for a study as shown in the figure below. If uh, one person from this study is randomly selected, what is the probability that this person has either type A or type AB blood? Okay, good. So this is a probability question, okay? Probability. That's the basic concept here. Um, are you familiar with probability, Sarah? Um, yes. Okay, good, good. Um, I'm going to show you. I've got a section on probability here on the rules for ACT math. And that's the first uh, basic concept that you see there on the screen. I'm going to magnify that a little bit. Go ahead and read um, that first bullet point for probability, please. Um, probability equals winners. Yeah, winners, and that's divided by? By the total number of possible outcomes. Okay. I'm not sure if you've seen another definition of probability. That's the one I like using. And when I say winners, I mean like the winning outcome that we're looking for, right? And so um, I always start with probability sort of describing like um, – describing a six-sided die, right? Sarah, if I said, what's the probability of rolling a, uh, a two on a six-sided die? What's the probability of rolling a two? Um, one out of 36, or... What's it, on a six-sided die? How many, how, many total num how many possible outcomes are there on a six-sided die? You can roll six different numbers. There's six different numbers, right? So six different outcomes. So when it comes to probability, I recommend to students always start with the denominator. Start with the total number of possible outcomes. Does that make sense why a six-sided die has six possible outcomes? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And so I said, what was the probability of rolling a two on a six-sided die? How many winning outcomes are there on a six, if, you're, if you're trying to roll a two on a six-sided die? You can only get the two once. So, yeah, you can only get the two once. So that means there's one winning outcome on a six-sided die. So the probability would be one-sixth. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, what if I said, what's the probability of rolling a 2 or a 3? What's that probability on a 6-sided die? There would be 2 over 6. 2 over 6, right? Because there's 2 winning outcomes, a 2 or a, a 3 on a 6-sided die. So 2 sticks or just one third, right? You could, you, could, um, you could simplify that if you wanted to. What about a 1, 2, or a 3? What's the probability of rolling that? Um, 3 out of 6, which is half. 3 out of 6, exactly, which is, which is 1 half. You could simplify that as well. What if? What about the probability of rolling a one, two, three, four, five, or six on a six-sided die? What would the probability of that be? Six out of six. Six out of six or, or one, one, right? It is definitely going to happen, right? And um, uh, you know, probably doesn't get any bigger than one, right? It's always between zero and one. Okay. Now, if I said, what's the probability of rolling a uh, a nine on a six-sided die? What's the probability? Um, zero out of six. Zero out of six, right? So uh, it's just not going to happen, right? So there's zero probability. Right, that you would roll a nine on a six-sided die. Does that all make sense? Okay. So this is a little bit more complicated question here, right? They're asking us: um, the person from the study is randomly selected. What's the probability that this person will have type A or type AB blood? Okay. And for probability questions, I recommend always starting with the denominator. Start with the total number of possible outcomes. Okay. And what is the total number of possible outcomes here? What is the pool that we're drawing from in this question? One hundred and fifty. Yeah, 150 people, right? It's the it's the total number of people in the study. And and the vast majority of the time, I'm going to say almost every time, maybe every time on the ACT, 
when um, it's a probability question, they'll start with the denominator. They'll start with the total number of possible outcomes. We see that there in the question, right? If one person from the study is randomly selected, and you're right, there's 150 people there. So that's your denominator right there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. And then what's the probability this person has either type A or type AB blood? Um, well, what's our, how many, yeah, how many winning outcomes do we have? Um, 67. Uh, we've got 67 because that's the type A, right? But it's type A or type AB. So what did, you, what did you say again? Did you say 67 plus 6? Yeah. Okay, yep, yeah, absolutely, right? And so that is uh, 67 plus 6 gives us 73. So we see which uh, matching answer choice. That would be answer choice. Uh, answer choice D. Yep. Thank you. Good. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. Um, so some probability questions get a little bit trickier, but I kind of want to go over that basic process. And I really strongly recommend starting with the denominator. Um, and sometimes, certainly on the, on the SAT, by just starting with the denominator, sometimes you can find the right answer just knowing the denominator. But then know that the numerator is always going to be, you know, e I guess it can be equal to the, the denominator. I wouldn't expect that on, on the ACT or SAT. But it's always going to be less than, which is why I recommend, um, I recommend starting with the denominator, because then you're just drawing from that, that bigger pool for your numerator. Okay? All right. Pretty easy. Starts off pretty easy. that and put the next question up and okay. ah yes we've got a mean question here go ahead and read question number two for me please um the monthly fees for single room for single rooms at five colleges are 370 310 380 340 Three hundred ten dollars, respectively. Yeah. What is what is the what mean? Is, of these what, is re what does respectively mean here? Do you know what respectively means? That means in that order. Yeah, in that order. Okay. And I don't think that plays a big role in this question here, but that does pop up on some questions. Be aware of that um, I see a lot on the SAT for sure as well. Respectively means in that order. Um, so just be aware of that. And then the last part of the question. Um, what is the mean of these monthly fees? Okay. Do you know what mean means, Sarah? It's the average. It's the average, right? It's classic average. And, um, you know, you're going to see different types of averages on the ACT. Um, on the rules for math, ACT math, I've got, um, let me see, I've got some statistics here. So you see mean is classic average, right? And that's, you add up all the values and divide by the number of values. Most students are pretty familiar with that. Um, median, that is, uh, median is the middle number. Um, and, uh, but... You only find you find the median when you add up all, add up all the sorry, uh, order the the values all in order from lowest to greatest. Okay, you've seen that before. Yes. The median. Okay, good. And then um, mode is uh, most frequently occurring number. So find you know if like there's three sevens right, and then everything else pops up just once, then your mode is going to be the most frequent. That's going to be that three, or, or there's uh, there's three the seven sorry. And then range is the difference between the highest and lowest number. Those all pop up on, on this test. I'm getting some funky feedback. Um, are you you're catching that on your end? Yes, I am. Yeah. Do you, can you try uh, plugging your, your earbuds again to see if that might? That I might don't have them plugged in. Oh, you don't Can you can you try plugging those in? See if we can get that working, perhaps. Yeah. We'll go back to the, the question. I don't Sorry. know if we have a mic. Um, I might be why the. Ah, okay. Why didn't come across? Okay. No problem, we'll we'll make it work. And, and in fact, it just disappeared right now, so I think we're I think we're good. Okay. okay. All right. So um, let's go back to this. And how do we calculate the mean then for these um, for these monthly fees? Um, you would add all five numbers together and then divide them. Great. Let's do it. Let's do it. You can use your calculator here, of course, throughout the ACT. So I'll do it with you here. Three seventy plus three ten. 340 plus 310. And what's the total amount? Do you have that? Uh, 
1,701. 1,700. I yeah. might have... I got 1,710. Which I think would make more sense, because I don't see any single digits here. Yeah, no, I missed a zero on the 300. Sorry. Okay, gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah, I think it's seven, seven, uh, 1,710. And then what do we divide that by? Um, by five. Divide by five. And... Where's that equal? Three hundred and forty-two. Three forty-two. There you go. That's choice H. Any questions about that? Okay, super easy, right? I mean, it just doesn't get a whole lot. <laughs> Isn't this kind of question? The level of difficulty does get uh, bumped up here, uh, in not too long. But I do want to go over these concepts because we're going to see these again, and again, and again just with some higher level difficulty questions. Okay. All right, let's go to the next one. Ooh, I like this one here. Okay, question number three, go ahead and read this for me, please. Um, on a particular road map, a half an inch or two feet apart. About how many miles apart are two towns that are two and a half inches apart on this map? Okay, so I want to go to the rules, I want to go to the rules for mathing here, and I want, um, I want to read rule number two here, okay? I really like um, I really like rule number two, and this applies to a lot of questions, especially word problems. Go ahead and read that rule for me. It's going to, it's going to apply to this question. Eliminate incorrect answer choices using basic logic. For word problems, remember that you are dealing with a real-world problem in a real-world situation. Yeah, it's amazing what you can do when you stop thinking in terms of like the calculations and just thinking in terms of basic logic and kind of basic estimation. And I think that really applies here on this on this question. Um, I, I wouldn't worry about like doing a specific operation. I wouldn't. I would just kind of think about it. Maybe even like maybe even draw this out. You know what I'm saying? Like like we've got half an inch here. You know what half an inch is, right? Yeah. I mean, something like that, right? And then just be aware that that represents 18 miles. Right. It's one half an inch. Okay. And the question is uh, about how many miles apart are two towns that are two and a half inches apart on this map? Well, what's two and a half inches going to look like if this is half an inch right here? What's two and a half inches going to look like? Could you describe that? Um, it's going to be two more. It's going to be what? Like, so you're going to have the half inch mark again and yeah. Then again. Yeah, let's do it again. And that's a hole. And then right? again that's an and again. inch. And then again and again. That's going to be two inches, right? And then another half inch here. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So it's 18 and then another 18 and another 18 miles, right? Because that's how many miles apart. Another 18, another 18. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the key here is we're sort of like understanding conceptually, right? How these, how these problems work. Okay. And not worrying about the operation. Like what we've got, you know, and now of course see the operation. All we've got to do is multiply 18 times five, eight. right? Does that make sense? But if you, if you get the concept, then you're going to figure out the operation. Does that make sense? Okay. So I really recommend, especially on word problems also, if you can draw a picture, draw a picture. Always draw a picture. Seems so simple here, but I mean, students can mess this one up. They do. They just kind of slap some numbers together and, and it doesn't work out. Um, but if you draw a picture like this, you're going to nail this. There's no question. I, we probably don't even need to maybe do the calculation. Look at some of these answer choices. Look at answer choice A. Right? Yeah, no. Like, that's Can't just be. that's just silly, right? Answer is B, ridiculous. C, ridiculous. D, also too small. I mean, we don't even have to do the calculation here. Double check. I mean, eighteen times five, but I guarantee that's going to be ninety. Yeah. All right, and we can confirm it. And and the nice thing about this too, then, is if you can eliminate all the incorrect answer choices and confirm the right answer choice at the same time, you can be one hundred percent certain that you've got the right answer. There's no messing this up. Does that make sense? So this is kind of like just the general test taking strategy I'm going to hammer throughout this course is make these questions concrete. Think in real basic logical terms. And you, and you can't mess up a question like this if you do. Okay? All right. Let's go to next. Uh, that's a good one here. Plugging in values. Yes, this is going to be one of the most 
frequently used strategies we're going to use uh, in the course. Go ahead and read question number four, please. Given that f equals c times c to the third, f equals 450, b equals 10 over c. Okay. Okay, there's, there's, there's an algebraic way to do this. Okay, where we could kind of plug in the 450 for f and plug in a, um, a 10 for d and kind of solve for c. We could do that. Um, we could also test answer choices here. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and I, I prefer, I really do prefer just kind of testing values and kind of thinking about this logically, okay? I want to read rule number, um, rule number one, if you will, please, for ACT math. Go ahead and read, uh, read that rule. Avoid algebra whenever possible. Instead, plug in values for the variables. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you can't do algebra here on this question. Um, if you're really comfortable with it, you know exactly what to do, I'm down with whatever gives you the right answer. But if you can just plug in values, this is a this is a calculator section question, right? I mean, you can use the calculator in all these questions. Just 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 plug stuff in, right? You're gonna get it right as long as you punch the right buttons. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's do this. Let's plug in. We're gonna plug in a 450 for f. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that equals c. I'm just gonna leave it c for just right now. C times D and D is 10 to the power of three. Okay. All right. Well, let's, what's, what's 10 to the power of three? Um. Yeah, it's 10, right. And, and this is where I like, I think about what, you know, don't worry so much about the operation. What is, you know, what does that mean? You're absolutely right. You know, to raise something to the power of three means you multiply by itself three times, right? But I guess, you get, again, you've got the calculator here. You should be able to, you, you know, just punch in 10 to the power of three in your calculator. Or if you want to do 10 times 10 times 10, you can. And what does that equal? Uh, a thousand. Yep. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So we've got um, C times a thousand equals 450. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, again, if you're really comfortable with the algebra, it's not super complicated. I, I do work with a lot of students that struggle with algebra and struggle with operations when it comes to isolating variables. Um, so I, I like to look at this one and, and think in real logical, kind of like basic estimation terms. I look at that equation. I'm like, C, can C be bigger than one? It can't be, can it? All right, it's got to, if I'm multiplying a thousand by something and I get something less than a thousand, it's gotta be less than less than one. And what's the only answer choice that's less than one? The only logical choice. Yeah. Okay. Is F. That's it. Bingo. Okay. Now again the operation's not super complicated if you want to isolate C, divide both sides by a thousand. Okay. Not complicated. One step. Real easy. And you punch that into the calculator, you'll get an answer choice F. But I'm just showing you kind of another approach to do it where you can sort of like just feel it out logically. And if you understand what the values mean, you can work it out. Um, and that's going to be really, really useful, especially when we start seeing some higher level difficulty questions. You can kind of just use a lot of basic estimation. We're going to see that a lot throughout this course. Okay. okay. Any questions before we continue? No. No? Okay. Good. We're going to keep rolling. Question number five. Yes. We got a functions question. Go to question number five for me, please. Um, if the function of x equals 3x plus 7, all roots squared, then function, function 1 equals. Yeah. So I would probably read this right here. I'd read that as f of x. f of x. Okay? okay. You can read it as the function of x, right? Um, you can. I most commonly see that interpreted as f of x, okay? And I want to make this really clear to anybody watching the the video here, which is that that doesn't mean f times x, okay? That throws a lot of students off. We're talking about functions here and function notation, okay? And anytime you see like f of x or p of x or g of x, we're talking about a function. We're not talking about some variable f, right? f is not a variable. f is a function, okay? And here's kind of how you, you interpret that. I'm going to give you a real simple function here. And I just want to make it really clear how functions work. You got a function like f of x equals 2x plus 1. Okay. And I said, what is f of 3? What does that mean? Okay. 
All I mean, the, yeah, go ahead. What does it mean? Uh, anywhere you see an X, plug in a 3. Yeah, where there was an X, you plug in a 3. That's it. Okay, so 2 times not X, but 2 times 3 plus 1. Okay, so what's F of 3? Yeah, f of three is uh, f of three is seven. Okay, and um, and here's the best way to understand functions. I, I I coach students to understand them in terms of inputs and outputs. Okay, x is your input. It's what you're plugging into the function. Okay, and in the case of f of three, three is your input. So we're gonna plug it in. Okay, and then f of three is your output when your input is three. So f of three is seven. So when I plug in a three, I get an output of seven. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're doing the exact same thing here. We're just plugging in uh, a 1 in place of the x. So let me see you do this on the whiteboard. I want you to give that a try. Just rewrite the function, but instead of rewriting it with an x, we're going to rewrite it with a 1 in place of x. Can I see you do that? I'm just going to make it really clear. I'm going to add... And then uh, let's simplify this. Let's do um, let's do some some PEMDAS, some order of operations here, right? You, are you familiar with PEMDAS, uh, PEMDAS, Sarah? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So let's calculate. So that's parentheses, exponents, um, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. I will have that on the rules for ACT math. Um, that'll be added on there, so you can reference that if you need to. So let's start with what's in the parentheses, and what does that equal? Um, three times one plus seven is in the biggest print. Yeah, and that's going to equal 10, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's just 10 squared. Which is 100. 10 squared, yeah, which is 100. Easy, right? I mean, man, this is really easy. ACT starts off so, so easy. I would argue the first 30 questions are really pretty straightforward. They're going to get a little bit trickier when we get out of the first 10. Um, but... Uh, but they're just testing you on your knowledge of these sort of basic concepts. Do you understand how a function works? Do you understand the relationships between inputs and outputs? And I've got a section here also on the rules for math on functions. Um, same thing here. Understand x is the input, f of x is the output. One more thing, too, it's going to be very helpful later on some other questions. You can understand f of x as fancy y, right? F, f of x and y are completely interchangeable on an xy axis, or just really in general. Um, so uh, any f of x value, you can substitute basically as a, as a y on a question. I think we'll see some questions coming up where that's going to apply. Any questions? No. No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Percent increase. Go to your question number six for me, please, Sarah. Um, George's current hourly wage for working at Venti Smiles is $12. George's told that at the beginning of next month, his new hourly wage will be an increase of 6% of his current hourly wage. What will be George's new hourly wage? Hmm, okay. Let's talk about percents real quick. Do you know what percent means? Um, a part of something? Yeah, it's a part, part of something, of absolutely. Part, right, per means part of or out of. And um, cent means 100. Right? Mm -hmm. Cent means 100. As in, uh, like, there's 100 cents in a dollar. Right? Or there's 100 years in a century. Uh, in a century. Sorry. 100 years in a century. So, 6% just means 6 out of 100. Or 6 divided by 100. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, if we want to find, so that he's getting a 6% increase on his hourly wage. It's very interesting. 6% increase. You know, before we do the operation here, maybe, maybe we can feel this one out logically. Do you know what a 6% increase in something would look like? Do you know what that would, what that would feel like? Is that, is that a big increase or a little increase? Uh, it's a small increase. It's a relatively small increase. Right? Like a 100% increase, you'd be doubling it. Right? Like a 10% increase would be... You know, I mean... It's not a big increase. Just knowing this, I'll bet we can eliminate some of the answer choices that just seem off. You know what I'm saying? 
what answer choice would you eliminate right off the bat? Just kind of basic estimation here. Um, I would eliminate the twelve point oh six because you're not just adding six cents. Yeah, you're not you're not adding <laughs> six cents. Absolutely, I love it. I love it. I love it. Absolutely, I would eliminate that as well. It's not a six cent increase. But then I would also eliminate J and K Absolutely. because it's not eighteen and nineteen dollars. Absolutely, they're just silly. The other two seem more logical, though. Yeah, the other two are pretty reasonable, and I, and I can guarantee it's going to be one of those two. Does that make sense? I mean, even if this is as far as you get on this question, and you don't know exactly how to find, like, a 6% increase, I'm pretty cool with that. Um, you got a 50-50 shot now on a, on, a, on a tough problem. If you didn't eliminate anything, it'd be a 1 in 5 or 20% chance of getting it. Right? And here you got 50-50 odds, which are pretty good. Okay. Now let's talk about finding 6% of something. There's, there's two ways to do percent increase here. One way to do percent increase, we just find 6% of 12 and then add that to 12 to find out what his new hourly wage is. Does that make sense? Okay. So to find a 6% increase or to find what 6% what of 12 is, right? We just take 12 and we multiply it by 6%, but 6% is a number. 6% is 6 divided by 100. Okay. And if you punch that into your calculator, you'll get 0.06. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right, and what does that give us? What's 12 times 0.06? 0.72. It, what is it again? Um, 0 0.72. 0 0.72. I already see an answer that's looking pretty good. All right, answer choice H. Let's confirm it. All right, so it's a 72 cent increase, and we just add that to $12, and we get $12.72. Does that make sense? Okay, so that would be answer choice H, which is correct. It is answer choice H. There's one other way to do it, okay? And instead of doing it, that was like a two-step process, right, where we found 6% of 12 and then added that to 12. You can do it in one step. If we multiply 12 by 1.06, that'll give us the 6% increase in one step. Go ahead and punch that into your calculator. Tell me what you get when you multiply 12 times 1.06. Twelve point seven two, right in one step, and the reason why that works, right, is because if we multiply twelve just by one, we'll get twelve, <laughs> right? Because anything times one is itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. But we're multiplying by something a little bit bigger than one, right? In fact, it's six percent bigger than one, so it's going to give us a six percent increase. Now, it's not absolutely necessary to use this method, you know, on on. Um, on this question, but on some other questions, knowing this is extremely helpful and 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 uh, and I would say necessary on some questions, on certainly on the on the SAT, but really helpful when we're talking about percent increase and percent decrease. Okay, you can do it in one step. I think I've got a section here on percent increase, and I do right here. Uh, basic concept D. Go ahead and read that first bullet point for me on percent increase. Twenty five percent increase of X equals. Uh, X at, times one, at, one point two five. Yeah, I want you to stop and just look at that. Does that make sense, Sarah? Why twenty five percent of increase of X is going to be X times one point two five? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Does it really make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yes. In okay. the same way that we just did the twelve. Yeah. Just like yeah, the the six percent increase is one point zero six. Okay, not one point six. That would be a sixty percent increase, right? Mm -hmm. If we multiply by one point six zero, sixty percent increase. But a six percent increase is one point zero six, and um, a thirty percent increase we'd multiply by what? Um, one point three. One point three. A forty percent increase we'd multiply by what? You cut out a little bit. What did you say? Uh, one point four. One point four exactly. Yeah. What about a four percent increase? What would we multiply by? Um, 1.04. 1.04, .04, exactly. Okay. Now take a look at that second part here, the 25% decrease, right? Now think about this for just a minute. If we're finding a 25% decrease of something, we got to be multiplying by something less than 1, right? Because if we multiply by 1, we're going to get itself. But to make it less than itself, it's got to be less than 1, what, what we're multiplying by. And here's how to think about it. If, we, if, if we're finding a 25% dec uh, decrease of x, basically we're finding what 75% of X is right because it's a twenty like a you, let's say you you, you want to buy a jacket it's a hundred bucks right 
If it's got a 25% discount, you're only paying 75% of the original price. So just find 75% if it's a 25% decrease. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So let's say it's a 30% decrease. What do we multiply X by? So 100 minus 30 oh. would be 60. Yeah. Well, we're not so multiplying X by 60, 30. right? But it's, yeah, 60%, which is, well... Um, it would be, if, if it was a 30% uh, decrease, it would be uh, just 0. 0.7, right? Because it would be 100 minus 30%, point se uh, so 70% or 0. 0.7. Does that make sense? Or no? Yes. I don't fully believe Yes, it, it does. <laughs> okay. Because 100 <laughs> minus 30 is 70. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 70 as a percentage is 0. 0.7. Yes, okay. yes, yes, absolutely. Um, what if it's a 40% decrease? What do we multiply the original value by to find a 40% uh, decrease? 0. 0.6. 0. 0.6, exactly. What if it's a 70% decrease? That's a big decrease. What do we multiply the original value by? Um, so it would be 100 minus 70, which would be 30. So yeah, so 30% so or 0. 0.3. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. And it'll pop up on some, some of the higher level difficulty questions. But it's nice to sort of approach these on the easier questions and get the, the basic concept done. All right. Let's keep rocking and rolling. I don't see sequences a lot on the ACT, or I don't see them at all on the SAT anymore. Um, but they pop up here on this practice test. So I want to go over this sequence. Go ahead and read uh, question number seven for me, please, loud and proud. What is the seventh term of the geometric sequence? What is the seventh term of the sequence? Okay. Okay, so there's a pattern here in this sequence. Okay, there's a pattern. And um, let's talk about these terms, this geometric sequence. I think it's going to be helpful to know what that means here, too. And I've got a section on sequences here. Go ahead and read that first bullet point on arithmetic sequences. Go ahead and read that, please. Um, arithmetic sequence. You are adding or subtracting by the same number. Okay. And then in a geometric sequence, what's going on there? Go ahead and read that for me, please. Uh, you're multiplying by the same number. You're multiplying by the same number. Okay. So this is a geometric sequence. So here, in this question, we're multiplying each number by the same number as we move along. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Bye -bye. So let's do this. I, I, I want again. It's sort of like the word problem thing. Like I want to make. I want to lay all this out like in very concrete terms, all right? So the first we got, we're gonna have seven numbers here. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, we're gonna have seven numbers here in the sequence. The first one is one. The second one's a negative three. The nine. Then negative twenty-seven. Okay. Okay. What are we multiplying each of these numbers by? It's a geometric sequence, so we're multiplying them, multiplying them all by the same thing. What are we multiplying them by? Negative three. Negative three, right? That's the only way to go from one to negative three. You've got to multiply that by negative three. And let's double check. When you go from negative three, if we're multiplying by negative three times negative three, um, do we get nine? If we multiply again by negative three. Yeah. Absolutely, right? If we're multiplying by negative three. Same thing, right? And then same thing if you go from 9 to negative 27, multiplying by negative 3. So let's just do the same thing. We'll just multiply all these terms by negative 3. Bust up that calculator. What's uh, 20, negative 27 times negative 3? 81. 81, positive 81, right? Because we've got a negative times a negative. That's going to give us a positive. And then what about, uh, let's do it again, 81 times negative 3? Negative 243. Ooh. Negative 243. Good change there. And then from negative 243, multiply by 3, what do we get? 700. That's choice E. <laughs> Any questions about that? No. Okay. All right. I don't think I've ever seen uh, an arithmetic sequence on the ACT, but again, this uh, this geometric sequence does pop up here. Just kind of be aware of what that means. But I love also, instead of like just trying to like punch everything into the calculator, like... I think it's really easy to lose um, to lose track of like which number you're working on. Do you know what I'm saying? Like if you're just punching it all in, like lay it all out, draw it out, draw those seven blank spaces and fill them in. 
and make it as concrete as you can. Okay. Okay. You're handling all these questions very, very well. I promise you they are going to get challenging. <laughs> um, we're working our way up here. All right, go ahead and read question number eight for me, please. The shipping rate for customers of Shipwick consists of a fee per box and a price per pound for each box. The table below gives the fee and the price per pound for customers shipping boxes of various weight. Greg wants Shipwick to ship one box that weighs 15 pounds. What is the shipping rate for this box? Mm, what is the shipping rate for this box? Hmm. Okay. So we ship in a box that weighs 15 pounds. We're trying to find the shipping rate. Let's do some graph analysis real quick. I just want to make sure we understand this chart really clearly. Okay. There's no title or anything like that here. But um, let's break this down. Um, let's start with the... Um, Let's start with the x-axis going left and right here. What is the x-axis here telling us? Going left and right. From left to right. What's that telling us? Oh, uh, weight of the box. Yeah, we got some different weights of the box. The fee. The fee. The price per pound. The price per pound for that fee. Okay. That's it. And then we've got like three different weights kind of right here. Does that make sense? Okay. We're trying to buy. Uh, we're trying to ship a box that weighs 15 pounds. So what's the? There's a fee for that, and there's a price per pound for that. Where is that on the chart? Do you see it? Yes, it's in the middle of the line. Yeah, we're right in the middle of the middle section right there, right? Because it's, if it's 10 to 15, 25 pounds, 15 15 pound box would be in there. Okay, so how do we calculate this? The price per pound, which is 65. Your box is 15 pounds, 15 times 0.65, and then you have to add it to the Let's do it. Let me see you do that. So 15 times 0.65 is 9.75. 9.75, you said? Is that right? Yeah. Plus what? Yeah. The $10 shipping Plus the $10 shipping fee. 19.75. There you go. Bingo. Any questions about that? No. No? Real straightforward. Honestly, the trickiest part of this question is just sort of figuring out what's going on in the chart <laughs> and making sure you understand that. Does that make sense? Like the the once you once you understand what's happening in the chart, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, but I really recommend students take time to stop and analyze charts and graphs. Study the y-axis going up and down. See what's going on there. Study the x-axis going left and right. See what's going on there. If there's a a title. In fact, start with the title. Generally, there's a title. Look for a key if there's a key. Then lastly, look at the data. And if your understanding of the chart is good, you're going to nail a question like this. Okay. Any questions? No. no. Okay. Let's keep rolling. Question number nine. All right. This one's a little bit tricky. Go ahead and read uh, question number nine for me, please. A computer chip. 0.32 centimeters thick is made up of layers of silicone. If the top and bottom layers of each are 0.03 centimeters thick, and the inner layers are each 0.02 centimeters thick, how many inner layers are there? Mm. Okay, what are we solving for here? Let's make that really clear. What are we solving for, Sarah? Um, we're solving for how many inner layers are in the silicone chip. Yeah. On word problems, I love underlining the thing that we're solving for, which is almost always going to be, let me rephrase that, it's always going to be in the last sentence of the question. Okay. How many inner layers are there in this computer chip? Okay. I want to draw a picture. Okay, this is really one of my rules for, um, on the rules for ACT math when it comes to word problems. If you can draw a picture, always draw a picture. Always. Okay. And then you might be like, but there's already a picture there. Like, yeah, but I want to draw a picture of the layers. Okay? I want to make this as concrete as possible. Does that make sense? Yes. So, like, let's do a cross-section, right, of, of the microchip right here. Does that make sense when I say cross-section? Uh, not quite. No. no? We're kind of looking at it like this. Like, is, we're, we're magnifying this part, that side view. We're, 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 ample, okay. we're magnifying that view. Okay, so we're getting up close to, to look at the layers. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
let's draw these layers. Now it says the top and bottom layers are each 0 0.03 centimeters thick. Okay. What is that going to look like if the whole thing is is 0.32 centimeters, right? Which they tell us right here. What is a 0 0.03 centimeters going to look like? Um, going to take out 0 0.03 and put the 0 0.32 centimeters. Say that again? Gonna, it's just going to take out the 0 0.03 centimeters. Yeah. Out yeah. of the point thirty-two. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be. Yes, yeah, it's a pretty small amount. I mean, it's like a tenth of it or something like that. I mean, it's just not much. It's gonna be like that layer up there and that layer down here. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, and that's like, you know, point oh three centimeters here, and then another point oh three centimeters here. Okay. Any questions about that? Are we good? Yes. Okay. Now the question is how many layers of the 0.02 centimeter, um, how many of the 0.02 centimeter thick layers are there here, right? And there's some number. I don't know what it is. We're going to find out here. But I think now that we kind of, I've got my head around it kind of conceptually, I know what this thing looks like. I know what to, I know what the operation is. I know how to calculate this. This is really easy, right? Because the top layers are going to be 0 0.03 plus 0 0.03, which is what? 0 0.06, exactly. So we got 0 0.06 of the 30, 0.32 centimeters covered. So basically, we've got to find out how many layers are going to give us what? what's 0 0.32 minus 0 0.06? 0 0.26. 0 0.26, yeah. The rest here, this part here, has got to be 0.26 centimeters. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Really obvious when you draw a picture. All right. Well, how many layers are going to give you 0.26? I think you can just look at the answer to I mean, like, this is just basic logic now, right? What answer choice is going to give us 0.26 centimeters? If each, each, if each of these layers is 0.2 or 0.02, I'm sorry. 13. Yes. Thirteen times Yeah. There you go. Any questions about that? Do you see how we avoided kind of like just doing a calculation right away? Yeah. Do you see that? That's really the name of the game on this test. I mean, each all these questions are real world questions. All the answers are real world answers. You can think and you should think in really, really concrete terms. And I'm not saying, obviously, don't do calculations or don't use your calculator. Far from it. Yeah. But you're going to think about it in the right way if you can draw a picture and make it really, really concrete. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. It's a different approach to the test. But um, it really simplifies, especially some of the higher-level difficulty questions when you start thinking about it in concrete terms. And the beauty is that you can start just using your, 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 your logic and basic common sense. And, and you can, you'll nail a question like this, no problem. All right. Let's do el próximo. Okay, go ahead and read uh, question number 10 for me, please. The table shows the number of cars Jing sold each month last year. What is the median of the data in the table? Ah, it's a median question. Median. What is median again, Sarah? Do you recall? It's the middle number in a series of numbers. Yeah, it's the middle number in a series of numbers. Now, this is it's a little bit trickier. I think some students are very tempted to be like, what's the middle number? It's like, oh, well, there's two middle numbers here. It's there. They're done. It's like, no, 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 you can't do it. It doesn't work like that. You've got to line them up in sequence from uh, least to greatest or greatest to least. And then you pick the middle number. Does that make sense? And in case you're, you don't remember the exact definition, I've got that here on the rules uh, for ACT math. Mean, median, mode, once again, median is the middle number. But remember, again, that's when they're lined up in order from least, least to greatest. So before I would do anything, I would, re I would rewrite these numbers from least to greatest. right? And make it, again, as absolutely concrete as possible. Don't just try to figure it out. 
let's line them up. Let's rewrite this. We've got we've got twelve months. So we're gonna have twelve numbers. Can we re rewrite these from least to greatest? Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. Let me see you do that um, here, just below the uh, below the question. Thirteen. I'm gonna cross as you add them. I'm gonna cross them out just so we don't we don't use them twice. We got sixteen. We got nineteen. We got another nineteen. Looking good. Looking good. We got twenty-two. Very good here. We got twenty-five. Another 25, I think, right? Six. Seven. Yep, and the rest are thankfully in order. All right. Okay. Great. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, now we got to find the middle number, right? That's median. And and if, if uh, some students you know, watching the recording can't remember the difference between mean and median or mode, um, if you drive, right, and many of you uh, no doubt do, um, what do you what do you call the middle of the road, right, between two lanes? That's the median, right? So that's always in the middle between two lanes going in the opposite directions. The median is the middle number. Now the tricky part here, notice we have twelve months, and therefore twelve different values. And um, so there's no middle number, right, if it's even numbers. Does that make sense, Sarah? Yes. Okay, so do you know what to do if there is uh, an even number of values? What do we do? We find the average of the two middle numbers. The average, right, the, the mean of the two middle numbers. What are our two middle numbers here? It's gonna be like you know, it's gonna be six number six and seven, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, twenty-three six. and twenty-five. Yeah, so it's twenty-three and twenty-five. Those are our two middle num middle numbers. So we got to find the average of that. What is the average of twenty-two and twenty-five? Um, twenty-two and twenty-five is forty-seven. Forty-seven divided by two is twenty-three point five. So twenty-three point five is the average, and I think we found our answer. You see it? Yes. Answer first, okay? Bingo. Yes. Any questions about that? No. Okay. Just kind of like even just scanning over the values, like some of these answer choices are really, really silly. I mean, like 13, 16, come on. And especially if you're lining them up in order from smallest to greatest. Right? Yeah. You know, 19, they love doing that. I mean, 19 is sort of like the closest one in the middle. You know, kids are gonna, but kids are gonna pick thirteen and, and nineteen here because they're, you know, in the middle of the chart, right? But that's not it. The placement doesn't matter until you line them up from smallest to greatest. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. We are cooking. Oh yeah, plugging in values. Good. Let's do this one. All right, go ahead and read question number eleven for me, please, Sarah. Student studying motion observed a car rolling at a constant rate along a straight line. The table below gives the distance d feet. The cart was from a reference point at one second intervals from t equals zero seconds to t equals five. Seconds. Okay. Which of the following equations represents this relationship between d and t? Okay, so we've got this chart right here in the middle, okay? Set of values for t and d, okay? And we know that when t is 0, what's our d value? 14. 14. When t is 1, what's our d value? 20. 20. All these match up, right? When, when t is 2, d is 26, 
from T's yeah. 3, D's 32, etc. Right, all the way through. Okay? This is so easy. All we've got to do is test the answer choices. Right? This is just a plugging in values question. Okay? So, like, let's see if answer choice A is correct. Let's plug in a 0 for T and see if we get... What, what, what should we get for the correct answer choice should give us what when we plug in a 0 for T? Um, 14. Should give us 14. Right? That set of values. So let's do it. Plug those in answer choice A. What do we get when I plug in a 0 for um, T into answer choice A? What do I get? Which? I'm sorry? You get 14. You get 14. Okay, so that looks good. Let's keep that. What about answer choice B? When you plug in a 0. Yep. You get eight. You get eight, so that's mm -hmm. no good. Try C. Mm -hmm. You get fourteen. Fourteen. We'll keep it. Mm -hmm. What about uh, D? You get yeah, you get zero mm -hmm. plus six. That's just six. That's no good. Mm -hmm. That's gone. What about D? When T is zero, um, you get zero, right? So that's gone. This is as far as you get. You got a fifty-fifty shot. Easy. Super easy. Just basic arithmetic. Let's test another set of values. Right? When we plug in a 1, we know the correct answer choice has to give us what? 20. 20. So let's plug a 1 in answer choice A. What do we get? Uh, 20 plus 14. Which is whoa, 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 whoa. For answer choice A? We're plugging in. Oh, 20 equals T plus 14. Yeah, T is 1. That's what we're testing right now. So, okay, so it'd be 15. So it's 15, right? It's going to be 1 plus 14. That's 15. That does not look good. Answer choice C, the only one that's left. When T is 1, we should get um, a 20. What do we get? C, so that's 6 plus 14. Like 6 times 1 is 6. Yep. Plus 6 would be 20. So there you go. We can confirm it. It is indeed answer choice C. Does that make sense? Yes. Any questions about that? No. Okay. It's a lot easier when you break it down like that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We just and just test the answer choices. I mean, and and look, we eliminated all the wrong ones. We can confirm the right one. Like we're, we're I would be willing to bet everything I have on that we got this question right. I don't have the answers in front of me. I don't. I mean, I've gone over these before, but but you know, I I might be willing to bet my life on this that we got this one right, just because I know it's not A, no, it's not B. I know it's not D, I know it's not E, and C works. And for the rest of the values, for that matter. I'm looking, previewing them right now, and they all, they all work. So, any questions about that? No. Okay. Um, same thing, too. If they give you a chart, right, or like a uh, like they do in this question, or if they give you a graph, like an XY axis, right, and they give you like a line. could even be a parabola. doesn't matter. And they're like, which of the following is the equation for the line? They give you a million, there's an infinite number of points on every line. Or on every parabola, an infinite number of points. Just pick the points and test them, right? Because they're giving you an infinite number of x, y pairs. Does that make sense? Or no? Yeah. yeah. You can turn all these questions yes. into arithmetic. All these questions. Let's do one more, and then we're going to take a little, little five-minute break here. All right, go ahead and read question number 12 for me, please. The length of a rectangle with an area of 54 square centimeters is 9 centimeters. What is the perimeter of the rectangle in centimeters? Okay, let's get, um, let's get some of this vocab down first. We know what area is, right? Yes. Right. Based yeah. Based, based times height or length times length times width, right? And then uh, you know what perimeter is as well, right? Yes. All of the sides added together. All the sides added together. Yeah. And I've got this on on the rules for math too. I've got some definitions. So I've got perimeter here. Most students know area. I don't have that on there, but I can add that. Um, again, we're trying to find all the sides of the figure all the way around. I've added it up here in this question. That's perimeter. Okay. Can we draw this? Can I see you? I want to see you draw this. I want to make it concrete. Again, I don't want to do an operation. I want to see this rectangle. 
And I think once we kind of see it, it's going to help us conceptualize it and help us make sure our operation is, is on the right track. So let's draw this triangle. It's got a it's got an area of fifty four square centimeters and uh, uh wait so it's a triangle with area of fifty four square centimeters. It's okay. So the length is nine centimeters. Can you draw that that rectangle where the length is nine centimeters and the area is fifty four centimeters squared? Uh, yeah. So the length is nine, and then the area is 54, right? And how do we get area again? Um, length times width. Length times width. So what's our width? If our length is nine, what's our width going to have to be? Six. It's going to have to be six. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, because nine times six is 54. Real basic, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so how do we find the perimeter now? What's the length all the way around? Um, nine and nine is 18. Yeah, so it's gonna be let's let's yeah, let's clarify what the, I mean all the sides, right? We've got two nines and two sixes and add all that up, what do we get? Um thirty is what do we get? I got thirty. Um that should be that is thirty. Yeah. Great. Next choice, okay. Nine plus nine plus six plus six. Any questions about that? No. No. Okay. Do you see how we, I didn't even really think in terms of operations. I was like, I just want to see this rectangle. <laughs> and yeah. and drawing it out, if, whatever you can draw it out, especially if it's a figure or something like that, draw it out, make it concrete. And, uh, and then your operations are going to be spot on if you're understanding the question in the right way. I don't even have to think about the operation. Just kind of see it and just kind of reasonably figure it out. Okay. All right. Any questions before we take a little break? Um, no. Okay. Let's take a little five-minute break. Um, go get some coffee or some water or some tea. I recommend something with caffeine. That's what I'm going to be doing. And then I'll see you here in about, uh, about five minutes, okay? Okay. All right. Thanks, Sarah. I'll see you soon.